Hi everyone and welcome to today's talk in our Evolution and Ecology seminar series. Uh, today we're very excited to have with us Dr. Greg Albury. Uh, Greg is a postdoctoral research fellow working at Georgetown University in Washington DC. He completed his undergraduate at the University of Oxford before obtaining his PhD from the University of Edinburgh, during which he studied the drivers of variation in parasitism and immunity in wild red deer. Following this, he worked as a visiting researcher at the Eco Health Alliance in New York before moving to Washington DC in 2019. Greg's current research focuses on understanding the spatial and social drivers of disease risk across a range of wild animal species. And the title of Greg's talk today is Density Dependence and Disease Dynamics Across System Synthesis. As usual, we will have a, a live Q&A session with Greg after his talk. So please post your uh, questions in the designated Slack channel. And without further delay, Greg, many thanks again for accepting our invitation to talk today. Uh, and we're really looking forward to hearing about your work. So take it away. Thanks for having me. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to share my screen. I think that's, even after a couple of years of doing this every week, <laughs> um, I think that's worked. Um, so uh, hi, I'm Greg Albury, and I'm a postdoc at Georgetown University, as, as Sarah said. Um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, my plan to carry out an integrative cross-system analysis of density effects in wildlife disease. Um, I'm based in Washington, D.C., but for, uh, for pandemic reasons, I'm currently in London. Um, I'm going to first give some sort of background on the problem, uh, and then I'm going to outline the, the methods that I'll use to tackle it. Um, it's sort of one of my first times actually synthesizing all of this information in one talk. Uh, so I'm apolog apologies if it's sort of very dense. <laughs> um, but I'll try to I'll try to lighten it up and make it um, as interesting and sort of uh, broadly uh, in people's uh, wheelhouses as possible. Um, so I'm first going to start off with thanking some collaborators collaborators whose uh, work is sort of scattered throughout this whole talk. Um, we've got Shweta, who's my supervisor at Georgetown. Um, Josephine and Dan, who were my uh, supervisors for my PhD. Uh, Amy, a postdoc at Edinburgh and uh, my ex-flatmate during my PhD. Dan, a meta-analyst and a nice guy from Indiana. Josh, a network scientist uh, and a research fellow at Oxford. And Quinn, a movement ecologist who specializes in uh, habitat selection and sociality. Uh, so Sarah gave a good background to me, but just to sort of quickly uh, give you some context for the sort of different study systems and stuff I'll be talking about. Um, so I, uh, in 2012, I did my undergrad, undergrad at the University of Oxford, where I worked on a, a wild population of, of badgers in White and Wood. Uh, I did my PhD at the University of Edinburgh, working on a wild population of red deer. Uh, a little brief foray at the Eco Health Alliance, working on um, host virus ecology and uh, predictive modeling. Um, and then I started at Georgetown University, where I started working on sort of um, more broad scale meta-analytical questions and uh, network analyses of, of disease and stuff like that. Starting in 2022, I'm doing a, a six month fellowship at the uh, Wissenschafts College in, uh, in Berlin, um, in which I'll be doing a lot of the analyses that I'm talking about today and sort of uh, seeing them through. Um, this talk is all about sort of run up and plans for this fellowship. So I, I welcome some critique in the co comments and uh, questions and stuff. Um, it's already, already been funded in, in some formats, so it's risk free and I'd really like your thoughts and input if you have time. Um, uh, so I have this sort of several different uh, things that I do with my time. Uh, the first one that I'm gonna be talking about today is the spatial and social behavior and how they interact with networks and wildlife disease. But I also have side projects in eco-evolutionary modeling, host pathogen ecology with this, uh, the Varina Consortium um, and eco-immunology and landscape level drivers of immunity, which I do with Dan. Um, I don't have a handy visual for this, so I'll just use Dan's face. <laughs> And this I do across a load of different study systems. So I sort of uh, take these ideas and apply them across loads of different animals, mainly, uh, including badgers, deer, uh, wood mice, uh, water dragons, flies, chimpanzees, great tits, and recently uh, fire ecology I've been involved in. Um, but the sort of premise for this talk is taking all of this fine scale uh, wildlife disease that I do within these populations and trying to blow them up to the sort of global consequences and uh, the sort of reasons that we care about them, uh, mainly sort of to do with global change and stuff. So this is sort of a personal journey to move from the sort of tiny scale stuff to the biggest scale. Um, to start talking about that, we have to start thinking about the, uh, the sort of first principles of disease ecology. Um, and the most important one of them and the crux of most of the complexities in this talk is that social behavior and population density can co-vary with both susceptibility and uh, exposure to infection. 
Um, so a good example of this is uh, at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, me and some of my friends, we saw all of these different uh, messages that you could see about the pandemic and the fact that it was coming. Um, this one on the left is, is to do with exposure. If you stay home, you're less likely to get exposed to the disease and therefore less likely to catch it. And this one on the right is to do with susceptibility, where if you are exposed to it, if you have a better immune system, you'll be better off. Uh, and these sort of two fundamental ways that disease work are uh, sort of central to a lot of the talk that I'm going to be giving. Um, they sort of co-vary, they interact, and they're, they're never sort of fully independent. But it's, um, it's important to remember that your disease burden is just a product of these two things fundamentally. Uh, this is sort of something that's been around since this, the dawn of eco-immunology, and uh, me and Amy recently wrote this review, which is uh, still in revision. Um, so fundamentally, your disease burden is the product of these two things. And because of this fact, if you make more social contacts, you should be exposed to disease more and therefore has an, have an increased burden. Uh, because higher population densities often mean higher contact rates, uh, because you sort of bump into each other more, that often means that you end up with, uh, with more disease. And this is called density dependence, basically. Different pathogens should exhibit different density trends, uh, but it's currently unclear how different pathogens have different relationships with population density. And uh, because we don't have this sort of cross-system understanding of the, these, these traits and these processes, it means that we're less able to actually predict how a certain pathogen is going to interact when density increases. Um, so there are loads of examples of, of evidence for this uh, that have been seen in these sort of big meta-analyses and reviews. And uh, fundamentally, the pandemic has been a good, good example of this when we started reducing population density, reducing contact rates, and therefore reducing transmission of the disease. However, evidence is relatively thin on the ground at the within species and within population level in wild animals, which is really important because it affects our understanding of selection and ecology. Additionally, there are loads of caveats to density dependence. Um, so while it is true that as you go from, from a less dense to a more dense population, you should get more exposure for a lot of different things, a lot of other processes co-vary with the density of a population. So for example, more dense populations tend to uh, aggregate on areas that have greater nutrition, uh, areas that have better food are more likely to support more individuals and therefore be higher density. Because nutrition is an important part of your immune system, that could mean that it's both more dense, but uh, more immune effectively, so therefore less likely to sustain diseases. However, as the density goes up, so does the competition for those resources, which could directly uh, contravene that. And importantly, as you have more individuals in the same space, it's more likely that you'll be able to find someone to cooperate with. So cooperation could go up. And this is important for things like grooming that directly reduce the burden of disease. For these and other reasons, the cost of group living is really regularly questioned. There's all of these reviews that talk about the fact that actually, as you get more social, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get more disease. And there's also this fundamental fact that a lot of the interactions that spread diseases do not actually become more likely with increasing density. So the network on the right has twice as many individuals and uh, therefore is much denser that all of those individuals are much more likely to be connected. Um, and this is true for something like uh, an airborne pathogen that would be spreading inside a, uh, say, a, a, an airplane uh, carriage. So you can see how if you have twice as many people in there, it's likely that you'll get twice as many exposure events as all of those people are breathing in the same air. Uh, that makes sense. But there are some interactions that actually don't become increasingly more likely with, uh, with population density. So a good example is uh, PDA. Adding more individuals into the same room does not necessarily mean that those individuals are more likely to be, to be making out. Um, it might be true in some places, like at nightclub, but it's not necessarily likely to be the case in the street or uh, at a conference or something. Um, and so this has really important implications for different pathogens that are spread by these different types of interactions. So if there was a pathogen that was spread only by PDA, it's less likely that it would actually have the relationship with density that we expect. Um, trying to predict where a pathogen falls on these, these different sort of uh, continua is really important for understanding how density will alter the, their dynamics when you're sort of modeling it. And importantly, very few interactions are only one of these things, and some of them uh, have very context dependent relationships with, with density. So a good example is handshakes. If you uh, if you're having handshakes, uh, if you look in the relationship between density and handshakes in a, in a conference, it's probably likely that adding more individuals results in, in more handshakes there, but it's much less likely in the street. 
so far we haven't actually really worked out how these things interact with density and how they how they respond to adding more individuals. So in reality, all pathogens fall somewhere between what we call frequency dependent, where they don't have any relationship with density, and density dependent, where they do. So good examples of frequency dependent pathogens are, are STIs, and density dependent pathogens would be sort of, uh, fecal oral pathogens that become more likely as you, uh, as you add more individuals. And apart from that, we don't really have very good resolution of what's in the middle. Um, in reality, we have more complex different continua that actually add complexity to this, this, this single continuum that you can see. Um, so the way that a disease is affected by density is basically that population density affects the probability of an interaction. And the interaction has a certain probability of transmitting the, the disease. And both of those things could be affected by density. So when you plot both of these different interactions on a, on a graph like this, you could have all of these different pathogens lying in different places according to their relationships with these, with these uh, processes. What this actually means is that you could have very complex relationships with density for different pathogens. So to walk you through it, here we have an example for a, a sort of a normal airborne pathogen, something like TB, where as you increase in density, you have an exponentially increasing likelihood that you'll share air with different individuals. And then if you have this completely linear relationship of interactions with transmission, you find that the, the probability of, trans, of successful transmission follows very exponentially with density. This is sort of one of the easiest things that you would expect to see. Um, and therefore, if you have the same interaction versus transmission function, when you multiply it by the, the density effect, you basically have this density versus probability of transmission that perfectly follows each other. Uh, and that's what you'd expect to see for, for this theoretical pattern that I've seen here. The reason this gets complex or uh, sort of difficult to understand is when you have something that has no relationship with density. So for example, sexual interactions might not be at all more likely if you add density. It doesn't matter what the relationship between interactions and transmission is, that line will always be flat. And you could even have, if those two uh, different things are, are completely against each other, you have a sort of somewhat linear relationship between density and, and probability. So this is all basically just going to show that if you treat uh, density or frequency dependent transmission as just one continuum, it loses a lot of, um, of resolution and importance or dynamics that are hidden within that one function. Uh, and in order to really understand the way that density is going to impact on infection, you need to sort of decompose it into all of these different things that influence uh, an individual's infection status. Uh, with regards to the sexual, sexually transmitted infections, for example, if it became less likely that uh, individuals would engage in uh, a sexual interaction if at greater density, which is, is pretty feasible, then you could actually have negative density transmission functions. Um, so it's important to remember all of this nuance when you're going into this stuff. Um, framing it with this, these two examples is sort of just a simple but slightly disingenuous thing for me to do because it's actually not just those two things. Uh, we have population density interacting with interaction frequency and there's then the probability of transmission which are these two but then there's the probability that that transmits to infection and then replication recovery of the individual probability of mortality etc cetera, etc cetera. and all of those things are actually going to impact on the infection statuses that you see of the individuals in a population and crucially all of those things can actually be affected by population density um, so that goes back to the thing that i was showing earlier where as you get a denser network you actually get all sorts of other things co-varying with it and there hasn't yet really been that much of an, a sort of attempt to understand how all of these different processes are producing density dependent trends in, uh, in disease um, and so that's sort of one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to get through in the course of this talk this is kind of similar to the, the Swiss cheese models of COVID infection that you might have seen, um, where there's all of these different processes that an, an infection has to get past in order to uh, sort of achieve onward transmission or infection. Um, that's the twin pillars of, of the sort of exposure and susceptibility are, are a good example of them. They're just sort of two of those, those slices, basically. We have equivalents for um, the spillover of zoonotic disease. And as I said, the twin pillars there. Um, so a good example of these uh, co-varying processes is density's uh, effect on cooperation and things like grooming. So if you have uh, density on the x-axis and grooming interactions on the y-axis, we have this sort of function where we don't know at some point density affects the, uh, the likelihood that you're going to be grooming someone. Um, 
And if grooming interactions convey a fitness benefit or, or some, some kind of benefit for the burden of disease, then when you combine them together, you get a fitness benefit through grooming that is occurring because of density, basically. Um, and so far, we, we have no idea what those functions are. So given these complexities, there's been limited sort of synthesis of all of these caveats, uh, and there's no predictive framework, as I said, um, which is where this, uh, this like dream team of all of these different study systems that I'm going to be talking about is coming in, because over the course of this talk, I sort of try to get at, like different elements of these questions and try to sort of bring it all together into some coherent narrative. Um, I'm going to sort of outline how they link together and give a case study for sort of each of them talking about the role of socio-spatial structuring in disease ecology. Um, so why is there this gap? Um, I went through this basically in this, this uh, review paper that I did, uh, which got published earlier this year, um, which was sort of a, a screed of me talking about like the benefits of looking at both social and spatial behavior in, in disease ecology. Um, and I, in, in it, I go into the details about this, this sort of density dependent stuff. Uh, but briefly, there's been a focus on between population comparisons rather than within population sort of continuous things, um, where you take a few different populations and look at how dense they are and see how that's affected their traits. Um, in this situation, it's much more difficult to control for confounders, which provides much less power. And there's also been this focus on social rather than spatial behavior. Um, and the reason this is important is because if you're looking just at uh, social behavior, not, you're not actually necessarily looking at density. Um, density has to be the numbers per space of, of individuals, basically. Um, and while that often does mean greater sociality, they're not quite the same thing. Um, social behavior is also not relevant to all parasites. Uh, so some are not spread through direct contact events. They're spread through sort of movement through the environment, stuff like that. Um, and also you, you're sort of falling victim to a lot of other confounders again. Um, the uh, confounding between spatial and social behavior is actually implicit in a lot of disease ecology messaging. Um, so a good example is a lot of the COVID related stuff that you might have seen, where actually a lot of the advice that you're getting was not necessarily social, but spatial. You'd be told uh, avoid crowded places, uh, avoid settings where you're not gonna be able to avoid people. Uh, avoid places where you're going to have to interact with people, stuff like that. Um, so these are actually subtly spatial cues rather than social ones. Um, so obviously I latched onto that really quickly. Um, why should we care is quite a good question. Um, first of all, because density dependent stuff is, is fed into models that are used to actually uh, predict and understand the dynamics of diseases. And if you fit the wrong density dependence functions, you can misunderstand your disease, basically. You can mispredict what's actually going to happen. It also provides us with loads of empirical insights, uh, one of which is sort of looking at how sociality evolved because density is supposed to be one of the, uh, density dependence is supposed to be one of the foremost costs of, of sociality. Um, we can use this understanding to design interventions for things. Um, and as, we, as time goes on, we have a world that is both densifying and urbanizing uh, and living closer together in, in cities is in many cases going to be uh, essential for greener living. Um, as the population of the world keeps increasing, I think it's important to understand how our denser cities and, uh, and countries are going to experience an increased potentially burden of disease as time goes on. And many of the, uh, the zoonoses, that, or many of the diseases that are currently uh, important in today's world are uh, diseases that have not been seen in humans recently or before. Uh, and being able to understand before they emerge how they're gonna behave is gonna be really, really advantageous. So the plan is, I'm going to collect a load of ecological data sets. Uh, I'm going to analyze them together to identify these, these density effects. And then I'm going to meta-analyze those to identify sort of general trends and predict density dependence. And I'm then going to incorporate them into models that we can use to predict how, how density dependence works. Using this, we can then make predictions about density dependence in novel systems and uh, about consequences of global change. Um, this is again kind of just a diatribe that I'm launching on, um, but I've written this review paper, just a single author one, uh, which basically sets out to, to talk about this whole problem and lay forward like a little framework that we can use to unpick it. Um, I sort of wanna be able to answer these questions fundamentally. How does adding more individuals to this location uh, affect local transmission? So if you add people to a church choir, how does that increase uh, air sharing, stuff like that? 
how do denser societies maintain parasites differently? So for example, if you have a, a denser city, how much more likely is it that this given uh, disease is gonna take off? And what impacts have these processes had on host and pathogen evolution? So can you sort of detect the, uh, the signal of, of density dependence in the way that uh, immune systems and things have evolved? Um, oh, by the way, I'm, I haven't yet submitted this, but um, because I'm sort of trying to make sure that I get as many friendly reviews as possible. Um, so if anyone is taken by this idea and wants to sort of critique me, uh, you'll get a great opportunity if you want me to just send this to you and you can rip it apart. So please feel free to email me. Um, so the talk progress progression is basically going to be uh, going through a few examples of things that are, are leading towards this, this predictive framework and talking about the work that I'm hopefully going to be doing in Berlin and beyond. So I've gone through the background. I'm going to be talking about the uh, spatial variation and how it affects infection, how density affects infection, and uh, the spatial structuring of social systems. Um, and then I'll conclude. So straight on to the spatial structuring of infection. Um, this is based on this 2019 paper that I published with, with the Red Deer. Um, so there are loads of different ways that the environment can affect the spread of disease. Uh, first of all, by affecting transmission efficiency, uh, there are certain pathogens like helminths that spend so long in the environment that the, the way that the environment is uh, affects how well they can transmit. Uh, the environment can determine local behaviors. So there are certain elements that might be more or less likely to be mating grounds, which would affect uh, how uh, sexually transmitted infections then spread in those areas. The environment determines movement patterns, which can then have knock-on effects on exposure for things like ticks and on social contacts for things like fleas. And finally, the environment affects immunity through things like uh, resource distribution, and that can have an effect on, on basically any kind of pathogen. So the population that I'm going to be talking about this with is the Isle of Rum Red Deer, which is home to 300 individuals and has been studied since the 1970s. Um, it's about 12 kilometers squared. Uh, they're censored 40 times a year, which gives us really detailed information on the population. And we previously showed that parasites correlate with, with season, reproduction, and fitness. So just a little bit of, this is what I did my PhD on for four years. I went around uh, staring at these, at these deer, identifying them, and co collecting fecal samples from known individuals. Um, and this is what that looked like. I would like to sit on a, on a hillside, wait for it to happen, um, take a little photo through the lens and then either go in myself or, uh, or guide someone. <laughs> um, so that was just a little bit of idea of what the field work involved. Um, so the analysis itself involved using every individual spatial behavior and trying to correlate that individual spatial behavior with their, their infectious burden. Um, so I wanted to I, see what spatial patterns were, were detectable across the population. And I used this, this method called INLA to do so which is the integrated nested Laplace approximation. Um, effectively, what INLA does is it takes this two-dimensional uh, distribution of disease as a response variable, um, where, say, individuals living in the red area would have uh, more worms and individuals in the blue area would have fewer worms. Uh, and it approximates them using this sort of uh, this gridded mesh of, of discrete variables, which makes it sort of very computationally efficient. Um, so I derived spatial locations, I fit this INLA model, and then identified whether space improves model fit, accounts for variance, or produces meaningful patterns. Um, to go straight into the results, what I found was that there were these really strong spatial patterns across the population. So this is a liver fluke, uh, which is interestingly spread by water snails and happens to be uh, highest in the wettest areas of the, the population. Uh, so you can see that this is the distribution of um, the study area. Uh, and along here, there's a, a, a river that runs down the glen, and this area is sort of very boggy ground. So we were thrilled to see that because it sort of implies that the, uh, the models are picking up real spatial variation. Uh, and we found that it also sort of varied seasonally as well, which is cool. But what was interesting, I thought, is that different parasites showed different spatial patterns. And for example, this one, strong oil nematodes, is really hard to actually identify anything meaningful from the, uh, from the population. So back in when I was doing my PhD, this made me start thinking, what is driving these different spatial patterns? And to do that, uh, I basically had to expand beyond deer. Uh, this is only three parasites of one population. And I thought, actually, many systems have spatially distributed locations like this. So maybe we could fit this same analysis across all of these different systems and try to identify what was actually driving differences in the spatial patterns that we saw. So I used this sort of broad, non-specific approach and used it to apply to a wide variety of systems. 
this work is now in press at Functional Ecology. So it's, it's been in the works for a while, but it's just about to come out, which I'm really excited about. Uh, we asked how common are spatial effects? How do uh, these different variables determine these effects? And eventually can we use them to inform mechanistic models? The methodology that we used was basically reviewing the literature with some really, really broad terms, identifying viable study systems and emailing authors. I sent sort of, you know, several thousand emails to people begging them for their, their data and many were very nice and did provide them. Um, I applied this same in the analysis across each study. Um, and then I asked whether things like transmission mode influence the range of autocorrelation and the probability of finding it. So this is what our data set looked like. We had sort of 30, 30 data sets with 90 replicates and they were distributed really widely across, across mammals. We restricted to mammals because we thought that it would be good to have some kind of concentration of different individuals. And we were, I'm most familiar with mammals um, and they often have sort of very good sampling location uh, data. So to expand on the, uh, the deer uh, analysis, I basically repeated this same process and got all of these different spatial, spatial ranges and then tried to compare them. And then I meta-analyzed the DIC weight. So just as a reminder, all of these different parasites could have reasons to have spatial variation, but we had this theory, which was that spatial effects would be smaller for uh, sexual and directly transmitted parasites. And then they would increase as you went through these different uh, transmission uh, mechanisms. The reason we thought this is because uh, environmental parasites like ticks spend so long in the environment that we thought presumably the spatial patterns would be stronger. Meanwhile, directly transmitted parasites actually don't transmit through the environment, they're transmitted through, through contact. And therefore we thought that they're less likely to be affected by spatial patterns. What we actually found is that most data sets exhibited spatial autocorrelation. Um, if you can see all of the, the uh, dots, each dot is a, a different model uh, of a different host pathogen combination. Uh, and dots that are above the 0.5 line, so up here are ones where the spatial model was better. So you can interpret that as evidence for spatial autocorrelation. Uh, and this, yeah, this y-axis is basically probability that the spatial model was better. It's the best way to interpret it. We found that that wasn't affected really by the, the size of the, the study, which is cool. Like even really small areas had quite strong spatial patterns. And also it was distributed across all of these different study systems. Um, similarly, it was distributed really widely across different types of hosts and across different types of pathogen. So really in all, we didn't have sort of much evidence that there was, there was any sort of difference in our models of different uh, spatial effects manifesting. It was also wasn't dependent on the transmission mode. So you can see here, directly, path uh, directly transmitted pathogens were actually really highly sp spatially structured, which is obviously the opposite of what we expected. We thought that it would, uh, they would be the least structured. So the conclusion that we take from this is basically, uh, there's an enormous amount of spatial variation that is manifesting across loads of different study systems, regardless of the size of the study system or of the host or pathogen that you're looking at. Um, and that is basically a good argument for taking and analyzing spatial data whenever you have the option to. Um, I think it's really cool because it means that there must be loads of hypotheses that can be tested using all of these different study systems, regardless of how big or how small they are. Um, and also crucially, if you take it and if you share the spatial data with people, then it means that people could test any number of different, uh, different hypotheses that they have. Um, that's becoming increasingly important as we're trying to sort of build like weather systems for, uh, for diseases, things like that, trying to actually predict on really broad scales how diseases are acting. Um, I'm very enthusiastic about it. So that's uh, part one, talking about just spatial variation itself. So we set about wondering what could be driving these spatial patterns, like what, whether there were any sort of generalizable uh, drivers that we could look at across them. Um, and one driver that should be fairly universal and which uh, we can analyze using just these data is population density. Um, so this is basically just talking about trying to use spatial measures of, of population density as a, uh, as a predictor of, of infection. Um, I'm gonna be talking about this in, in badges, but it's, it's applicable to lots and lots of different systems. Um, so the premise for the Badger paper is basically that uh, parasites alter social networks. So a good example is, is here in these ants, where when you infect certain individuals with ants, they become less connected to their, their social network because effectively uh, individual behaviors are resulting in the reduction in transmission of the disease because you reduce your, your connectedness to other individuals. 
Um, this is known to happen for social networks and it should also happen for spatial networks or determine space use. So this is a, a landmark paper that was talking about this. It's called a landscape of disgust. Uh, it talks about the fact that the way that you use your environment should depend on the distribution of disease in the environment. Um, it's based on the concept of a landscape of fear, which is talking about um, how predators affect the way that you uh, interact with your environment. So a good example is if you know that there's a stream that is often fouled, you're less likely to use it and therefore it de uh, de determines your distribution in the environment. This uh, sister paper to this talks about the sort of ecological and evolutionary consequences of that, that fact. Um, I think it's really interesting. Um, as of relatively recently, well, there wasn't sort of great evidence that a landscape of disgust actually existed, which is what we were sort of setting out to look for in the badgers. Um, so European badgers, as I'm sure many of you might know, are omnivorous mustelids that are really well studied for, uh, for bovine TB. And there's this study population in, in Whiteham Woods in Oxford, uh, which is there. Um, these are the badger people that I worked with. So that's Chris Newman, David McDonald, and Christina Buesching. And this is their PhD student, Julius Bright Ross, all of whom are on the paper. Um, and I actually started off working with them, yeah, for my undergrad project. And this is a photo of me at age 19 at like 6 a.m. getting up to do badger, <laughs> badger trapping. Um, so that is what the, uh, the study looked like back in 2014, 2015. And this is what it then evolved into when I sort of, I contacted them in 2020 and was like, can we, can we pick this back up and start doing this analysis again? So badgers have really interesting social systems and they have, there's lots of evidence for really complex sociality effects on disease. So just to give just a couple of examples, as adult group size increases, the proportion of the adults that are infected with TB goes down. And as group size uh, goes up, so does the uh, probability of infection there. Um, as a general takeaway, badges are sort of a really good system for spatial and social analysis. Um, and they have really complex spatial behaviors that are important to public health. Uh, and they have this sort of loose social system that's characterized by a lot of conflict and, and a lot of disease. Uh, so the, badger, the parasites that I'm going to be looking at are, are I've got four of them basically. So we've got um, arthropod ectoparasites, including badger fleas, lice, and generalist ticks. And then these two protozoa and endoparasites called Imeria mellis and Isospora mellis. Uh, but Isospora was not very interesting, so we just focus on these four. And our statistical approach involves INLA again. And we basically fit these basic phenotypic models that include things like sex and age. And then we fit spatial autocorrelation terms, as with the previous analysis, uh, just to investigate the spatial patterns. Mm. And then finally, we fit loads of behavior metrics to investigate how social and spatial behavior um, drive parasitism, basically. So that includes social group size, co-trapping networks, and spatial measures of population density. And what we first found was that these parasites have really strong spatial structuring, but they're interestingly really different spatial patterns across all of them. Um, what I thought was really cool is that they're, they're all sort of feasible, I think, um, and really interesting. There's, um, for example, Imeria down at the bottom is a, is a gastrointestinal parasite that's spread um, fecally, fecal orally, and um, it perfectly follows the, uh, the distribution of the Thames River, as you can see. So that's sort of where the, the dark areas are. Uh, so obviously one of the potential drivers of, of these patterns is uh, the distribution of the population and the population density. So that was what I was then hoping to sort of try to explain with the following stage. And the behavior metrics that we include, as I said, are group size, co-trapping network, and the spatial population density. So this is what the, uh, the distribution of badges looks like in space. We basically discretized that and, and gave each individual a, a density value based on their location on that, that kernel. Um, so we use several different measures of it, like annually varying lifetime average and, and trapping frequency. Um, what it basically means is if you are found in an area where there are lots of other badgers, you are given a value of high density. So this is effectively what we're setting up to ask is, is the distribution of parasites in the environment uh, or in these individuals uh, determined by the distribution of badger density? When accounting for all of these other uh, metrics like age and sex and stuff. And what we did find, unsurprisingly, was that parasites correlate with lo local population density. But what surprised us is that it was negatively and for all four parasites. So rather than finding this conventional uh, effect where living in higher population density areas results in more parasites, we found the opposite. We found that individuals who are living in high density areas have few parasites. 
And that confused us. <laughs> and we were thought sort of, why could this be? And we came up with a load of different, uh, like a laundry list of things to test. Uh, and that was how I came up with, with this sort of framework, thinking about what could co-vary with density. Uh, and remember, some of these are to do with exposure, so how often you encounter a parasite, and some of them are to do with susceptibility, which is how often, how easy you are to infect with said parasite once you encounter it. Um, so I basically set up like a series of, of models in this analytical structure that allowed us to differentiate between these things, uh, sort of chaining together these different models in a sort of, um, yeah, in a series, I guess. So we had these, these theories. So one, cooperation, badges could groom each other, uh, like I put forward at the beginning. So in higher density areas, if there's higher rates of grooming, you could have fewer parasites. It could be nutrition, where badges congregate in better quality areas. There could be local die-offs, where parasites kill individuals in high density areas, which then makes them low density. Um, or there could be self-ostracism happening, where infected individuals leave their sets and go to areas of lower density. Um, or there could be avoidance, which is basically that in individuals avoid infected areas. To go straight into it, we found that uh, cooperation and nutrition were not the, uh, not the cause, uh, or not likely to be the cause, I think. Um, we found that there was, there was no notable effects of the direct social measures, which is what you would expect if there was sort of cooperation. You would expect that, dense, uh, that grooming, something like that, was better described by, um, by your number of social partners or things like that, rather than the spatial measures of density. Um, we didn't think the nutrition was likely either because there were these quite strong body condition effects that we saw uh, affecting parasitism, but um, even accounting for them didn't get rid of the density effects that we saw. Uh, so you would expect that if the higher density areas were just congregated on, on better quality areas, then you, you would see it in the condition effects, not in the, um, in the parasites just themselves. Uh, similarly, we only saw very weak survival effects, which gave us very little evidence for, um, for die-offs, and it was only for, uh, for lice and for cubs. And uh, these models are quite complex, but we found that there was no evidence for ostracism because individuals didn't move away from areas of high, high uh, density towards areas of lower density and therefore lose parasites as they went. Um, we basically found that the, uh, the covariance was happening between individuals rather than, rather than within individuals, which is what you would expect if it was a change in behavior that happened. Uh, I can explain a bit more about these models if anyone wants more detail uh, at the end. But what we thought that was that basically once we've uh, eliminated all of these other possibilities, avoidance is probably the most likely one. And we had sort of this prior expectation that this might be the case uh, because of these experiments that have happened in badges before where effectively treated badges move set locations less often, which implies that they're, they're moving set locations partly because these, these sets accumulate parasites. Over time, they become sort of, because they're sort of dank holes in the ground, they get full of fleas and things. Uh, and if you remove the badges, that stops happening and they can find new places basically. Um, so if you treat the badges and it stops them from moving, it implies that they were moving because of the parasites. Um, one question is whether this happens proactively, whether they move before infection or whether it happens post-infection. So you can see, you can either identify areas of the environment that are likely to be filled with fleas and then avoid them proactively, or you can be living in a place, find that it's too full of fleas and then leave. Um, we, I call this the floor is larvae because it's, uh, it's kind of an intuitive thing of like, you find yourself on somewhere, uh, somewhere inhospitable and you end up leaving uh, as a result. So that in that case, a parasite is sort of like a push factor, pushing individuals away from these highly parasitized areas. So in summary, badger society is concentrated in areas of lowest parasitism, independent of any other drivers. Badgers might avoid areas suited to high transmission and therefore minimize exposure related uh, costs. Uh, it could re require identifying those drivers or it might not. Um, this basically therefore provides evidence for a landscape of disgust, I think, because it, it shows you that um, the distribution of infection in the environment is determining the distribution of the society itself. So I have loads of future questions, which I can go into more detail about some other time if you want, but these are a load of them. Um, the one I'm most interested in and the one that is most relevant today is looking at how general these findings are. So to look at that, we go back to the, uh, the meta-analytical data set, and I applied that same density analysis to all of these different data sets. I reduced, these, um, reduced them to these sort of trapping data sets and repeated the analysis and derived the density effect coefficients and sort of asked whether they vary across systems. 
And I found that um, there's loads and loads of variation in the effect of density across these, these different systems. Um, there are way more significant effects than would be expected given chance. Uh, and although they're slightly positive, there are also loads of significant negative effects as well, um, which effectively means that the, uh, the sort of orthodoxy, I think, that density generally will positively correlate with, with infection is not necessarily, uh, not necessarily true in wildlife disease data sets. So a good question is what might cause this variation, transmission mode, host movement, or sampling? Um, we haven't gone into too much detail because this is only a very preliminary analysis um, and I still want to collect more data and, and look into it more. But it does seem like transmission mode is having an effect. Um, interestingly, it's uh, most and significantly negative for directly transmitted parasites and most and significantly uh, positive for fecal oral parasites. Um, so yeah, these, these aren't results to take home to the bank, but I do think that it's, it's encouraging and indicative that we could find something if we look at these patterns across lots and lots of data sets. And therefore, if you can understand them, if you can get models that accurately model these effects, you can probably predict them. Um, at least that's, that's the hope. Okay, so finally, we're gonna be talking about the spatial structuring of social networks. Um, so what this is basically going into is looking at to what degree these, these contact networks that you find are, are, are spatially structured in the, in the environment. Um, and crucially, what kind of spatial behaviors can determine your social behaviors or your social environment. Um, so to do this, I'm talking about the deer again. Um, and what you can see from this population is that the social and spatial network really closely follow each other. What I wanted to do was rather than just sort of eyeballing this and looking at them sort of qualitatively, I wanted to build an analytical structure that could actually identify what spatial components are influencing uh, your location in your spatial network, in your social network. And the reason the deer are so great is because as long as the data go back, the field workers have been identifying spatial and social uh, behaviors separately. So it's spatial locations and social groupings. Uh, and we can therefore make these two networks separately, which is really cool. Um, so to do so, I've taken the censuses uh, with these sort of 400,000 observations, and I've taken the group memberships and made it into the annual social networks. I then look at how those things are vary according to all of these different spatial characteristics. Um, so that includes home range overlap between individuals, home range area, so how, how far you, you range. Uh, and that's the name of the, uh, what's called the paper, if you want to look at it. Uh, and then I've taken their centroids and I've fitted the same inlet effect that I showed you guys earlier, just to look at the, the sort of spatial variation in the fabric of the network. I've then fitted the same density kernels as from the, uh, the Badger analysis uh, to look at how, where the population structure is around you determines how you interact with other individuals. So that's basically looking at how, how uh, your social uh, contacts are determined by the spatial distribution of those contacts. And then I've looked at, again, all of the other sort of phenotypic effects that are always in these, these models. And what we found really is that landscape location really influences sociality. So because this population is, is really heterogeneous, and in particular, there's this sort of really strong distribution of, of resources along the whole, uh, uh, what's it called, the whole population, all of the resources are, are sort of focused in the north of the Glen here, and then sort of decreased going outwards. And that means that there's this really strong density gradient likewise. Um, so what you see when you fit the in the model is that individuals living in these areas of high resources tend to have more contacts, uh, which again goes back to the, the uh, what's it called density figure that I showed at the start, talking about how nutrition co varies with density. So what's really interesting about this is that you have this uh, spatial pattern that is actually inversely related to the uh, the distribution of some diseases, like I saw, and that means that if you if you don't consider space alongside considering sociality and disease, you could get up this spurious distribution that is actually driven by the distribution of the land in the area rather than what the individuals are doing. Um, so I think that's just an interesting uh, cautionary tale, I guess. So looking beyond uh, the sort of simpler metrics, what we actually found is that lots of different uh, social network metrics varied really differently according to spatial location. I think the one that is most interesting that I'll draw attention to is betweenness here. Um, your betweenness in a, in a network is basically uh, how easy it is to get from other areas of the network to other areas of the network when going through you. 
Uh, so it's it's sort of if you connect disparate parts of the network together, you have a high high betweenness. And what's interesting about this is that it's it's really high in these individuals who live in sort of an intermediate area between two population hotspots. So the model is doing sort of what we expect. It's identifying the uh, the change in the fabric of the network. And without going into sort of too much detail about what's here, what this effectively shows is that the most important components of the model were the, uh, the 2D location on the landscape, followed quickly by density. Um, so those are two things to, to sort of consider when you're looking at the, the spatial drivers of social network structure. Uh, and that is also mirrored here when you're looking at how much of the, uh, the model is driven by those things. So we have DE is density. You can see it's really important across these. And then SP is the spatial location all across those. So what we really want to know, again, is how general are these findings? Um, we want to know how density correlates with interaction or association frequency. And we want to know whether the shape of this relationship is, uh, is linear, log linear, or exponential. This is basically getting back at those questions that I asked at the start, talking about how if you add more individuals in space to the same place, how does it alter the way in which they interact with one another? Does it sort of suddenly increase at a high density, or does it increase linearly as you go on? Or if they avoid each other, as you add more individuals, it might be that it tapers off and you stop actually seeing uh, increasingly dense social networks if you add more individuals. Um, you see a lot of these patterns in general in, in animals, but it, there's sort of still no uh, predictive fine scale understanding of, of how this would happen if you added more individuals into the same place. We also want to know how does social proximity correlate with spatial proximity and how does as the uh, social network spatially structured. And then following the structure of the previous meta-analyses, we want to know how those findings depend on host traits, interaction type, sampling regime. And therefore, putting them all together, how can we predict density dependence of interactions uh, a priori? And we have a few study systems that I have sort of looked at these in already, even though I'm sort of I'm starting setting off collecting more. So if anyone is in possession of, of systems with both spatial and social behavior, who would be interested in getting involved in a publication like this, please let me know. Um, so we have the St Kilda Soe sheep, the Isle of Rum deer, the badgers and the great tits at White and Wood. Um, and we have a few more, but these are the ones that I'm sort of focusing on. What you can see from this is that as you add more individuals on the x-axis, so this is density of individuals per kilometer squared on the x-axis versus the number of times that they associate with other individuals on the y-axis, you have this really strong, almost linear relationship in the deer. So as you add another individual per kilometer squared, it, it, it results in a sort of linear increase in that individual interacting with other individuals. But interestingly, the soe sheep who are at much higher densities have this sort of tapering off, which implies that actually, as you add more and more individuals in space, you don't see quite as much of an increase in associations as time goes on. And there is, there does even seem to be a bit of a decrease near the end. Uh, in the badgers, you have a similar kind of tapering off as you, as you add more individuals in space. Uh, and in the great tits, it's sort of harder to tell, but I think that's sort of more linear. Um, what this shows is that generally greater densities means more interactions, which is what we expected and what we were hoping for. But there seems to be a lot of variation in that shape between study systems. And interestingly, if you facet that by, by different years, you see that there's loads of variation in the shape of those, those relationships between different years of the same population as well. Um, so there's loads of variation to investigate and loads of cool stuff that we could be looking into. Uh, and I have loads of questions going forward, um, which I'm happy to talk about in, during the questions. Um, but for now, my conclusions. So number one, infection is commonly spatially structured and it's unpredictably so across different systems, at least at our sample sizes. Density is a very common driver of these spatial patterns, uh, but not necessarily positively. And uh, density does drive interaction frequencies repeatedly and sort of semi-linearly. So for the future, I'm looking to collect more data sets, eyes emoji. Um, I'm going to do this review. And again, if anyone wants to read it and berate me, please get in touch. Uh, I have this fill trans theme issue for spatial and social behavior that I'm doing uh, or looking into putting in with Quinn. Uh, and I'm going to hopefully incorporate all of these traits into eco-evolutionary models, which I'm, I'm doing with, with Mike Boots from Berkeley, uh, who just so happens to be in Berlin at the same time as me. So it's uh, gonna be good. Uh, and therefore we're gonna sort of use them all to, to predict future, future trends. This is the, the uh, fellowship that I've got at Wissenschaftskolleg. Um, anyone's in Berlin, feel free to drop by.
uh, I'm looking forward to it. And I think it's going to be, hopefully you've agreed that this is going to be an interesting thing to look into. And I'm going to be doing six months doing it anyway. So uh, thanks very much for listening. Um, please let me know any questions. Thanks uh, for that amazing talk, Greg. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in uh, on the chat. Um, so one question is, is there a reason that you have largely ignored fungal diseases uh, in your analyses, uh, in particular opportunistic dermatophytes that should be prevalent among the badgers, for example? Um, I think that the reason, there isn't an active reason that we haven't looked at fungal stuff. Um, I mean, there might have been a couple of fungal diseases in our data set, um, but there weren't enough to actually analyze together, I don't think. Um, I think the answer is that, that fewer people have been looking at them in mammals. Um, yeah. But the, uh, the badger people have sort of a, one of the reasons it's such a great data set is because it's sort of decades going back and they've always sort of looked at ectoparasites more than anything, because um, mm -hmm. they're sort of easy to, easy to quantify. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I was wondering, in your meta-analysis, looking at the effects of spatial variation uh, and patterns, you restricted your analysis to mammals. Um, do you think that you would see kind of a similar importance of spatial effects across other kind of vertebrate host species and, and other, other taxa? So, for um, your question. <laughs> so I think, um, yes, I think is, is a short answer. Because I think they're actually, it's sort of setting the bar very low, just looking at, is there spatial variation? <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think the reviewers, some of the reviewers thought that as well, basically, but it's sort of surprising that it hasn't been established to that degree. Um, I think a lot of it depends on, on how you choose the scale at which you're looking. Mm -hmm. um, there's a load of examples of like where the nesting locations of different birds have influenced their um, sort of spatial patterns of infection and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I'm sort of optimistic that, I mean, we do hope to start looking at birds. It's just that the mammals was an easy, easy first target. Um, yeah. But I, I'm pretty confident that we'll keep finding the same stuff we do in the great tits and that's the, a good n of one <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um so another question uh, is the tapering off at high density due to something like brownian motion where the extra individuals inhibit their ability to interact that's a really good question i uh, i think maybe i um I, th I think it sort of falls under the category of uh avoidance somehow uh, i so I haven't really looked into exactly what's what's causing any of the downturn enough because it's too recent a result for me to look into. Um, but I think lots of these like gas laws often sort of ignore the fact that like individuals have territories basically. Um, and I think if we look at the subdivision of the territories of uh, different individuals and the way that they aren't actually allowed to get to different parts of the uh, population, then I think we'll find out quite a lot from that. Um, that's one of the reasons that I want to do the spatial and social correlation of different different sort of uh, metrics, yeah. looking at how home range area determines this stuff, I think will be really interesting. Yeah. Cool. Um, another question coming through. Uh, I was interested in whether the diversity of hosts um, a parasite infects might affect density dependence. For example, whether a parasite is a generalist or a specialist. Yeah, no, I think um, that was one of the things that we considered a bit in the, um, the badges as well is um, the only one that we thought, so obviously like uh, interspecific dilution effects is quite an important one. Um, fortunately, the stuff that we've been looking at mostly has been sort of specific parasites, um, mm. but there's a huge amount of literature on um, dilution effects that happen between different species and sort of the changes in biodiversity and how they alter it. Um, but yeah, I think so. That was one of the, the parasite traits that I was hoping to put in actually is um, generalism or sort of the number of different hosts that they can infect. Um, do you think um, co-infection might also be an important thing? I hope so. Include. <laughs> um, we, um, we have like sort of a long laundry list of stuff that yeah. we eventually want to look into. Um, and loads of the different populations did look at more than one parasite. Um, yeah. And uh, my mate Amy, who's on the on the paper, is, is a big co-infectionist. Yeah. Um, so I think she would probably force us to, even if I wasn't interested in it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm not sure how... One of the most interesting things about the badger uh, analysis is that all of the different parasites have really different spatial patterns. But if you're avoiding four different parasites that all have different spatial patterns at the same time, 
it's there's clearly going to be a lot of sort of trade-offs between them yeah um so amy and i were thinking a lot about um sort of co-infection interactions that occur through avoidance rather than from actually co-infecting each other mm -hmm. yeah um so I had a question about the badges as well, just thinking about the kind of proximate mechanism by which this kind of landscape of disgust actually happens. So is it like olfactory or you mm -hmm. know, how are they actually avoiding areas of high infection? Like how do they detect them? So uh, the badger people had some theories uh, thinking about, um, you can look at the sort of environmental uh, or the, like the microclimates of the different sets um, and sort of hotter, more humid sets are, are better at maintaining parasites basically mm. um so it could be that they have a sort of optimal level of of heat and sort of um i guess wind things like that that they yeah. that they sort of use they are really very particular about where they pick their, their sets and they they even like face them on a certain angle um i think it's probably actually more likely that it's that it's reactive i think the fact that you might just be if you, I think if you're a badger, you probably take it into account some, somewhat. You don't want to be in like a really, really hot, humid <laughs> set, but you could pick it for so many reasons like that. Um, I think it's probably more likely that as they're there for a while, if you start itching really soon, you start going like, I'm not staying here. Yeah. <laughs> in the same way that you would leave an Airbnb if you found that yeah. sort of thing. Um, and I think over time, that just means that there's sort of a, like a, a migration out of those areas. That means yeah. that you just sort of accumulate this like slight density pattern. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, and maybe uh, one final question as well. Um, how does immunisation um, uh, to say less virulent strains versus being exposed to novel, highly virulent strains to trend with density? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I guess it comes back to sort of similar to the co-infection one. Uh, I don't really. So most of the diseases that we were looking at was were endemic and sort of not very immunising. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we fortunately don't have to worry too much about it. Um, but some of the strongest density effects that we saw were in epidemic, very immunizing, um, very severe ones like um, CDV in foxes had like a really, really strong uh, density effect. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't know if the, the data on virulence exists to the degree that we could use it in, a yeah. it doesn't in the ones that we've been collecting, um, but it would be really interesting to think about. Um, yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much again for an amazing talk, Greg, and good luck with your um, fellowship as well um, next year. Um, we'll be returning with our next talk um, next we oh, Wednesday, November the 3rd, uh, with Professor Steve Simpson from the University of Bristol, who will be talking about the impacts of global environmental change on marine ecosystems. Uh, make sure that you follow um, the Eco Evo seminars on Twitter for updates and also join our Slack channel. Uh, and thanks everyone for watching uh, and see you next time. Thanks very much.